Uganda, a country of spectacular beauty, but a place where history still haunts the present. The streets of Kampala are crowded and often chaotic. It's a busy capital city. On the surface, things are said to be doing well here. A country in economic recovery. But beneath the surface, things aren't so rosy. This story is about Uganda's Asians. In 1972, the infamous dictator Idi Amin stole their property and threw thousands of them out of the country, including my own parents. Now, decades later, some Asians are returning to reclaim their lost fortunes. I've come here to discover my own roots and to try to understand how the horror of what happened here 35 years ago cannot be forgotten. I'm on the Ismail Road, a road named after my family, the Ismails, Ugandan Asians who had made this country home for generations. In fact, 35 years ago, my parents, just married, traveled this very road to begin their new lives in their new home right over there. My mother and father on their wedding day. They had their whole lives in front of them and both had big plans for the future. I had a big dream that I would be living in a big places and all that, you know, nice house. And there was a nice life, you know, in Uganda. We used to go out, you know, nightlife. So I thought I will do it more because when you are not married, you're not allowed to go out that much. So I, I had all those dreams that after marriage I can do all those things. But within two weeks of my parents' wedding, their dreams would be shattered. If I see the minister is a coward, automatically I kick you out of my office. Because I know that you have got something wrong with you. Idi Amin, Uganda's 1970s president, the so-called killer of Kampala. A man whose political opponents turned up dead in the streets. In August 1972, Amin said a dream, left him convinced that the root of evil in his country was the presence of 80,000 Asians, people like my mom and dad. He ordered them out, giving them just 90 days to leave the country. My father has never forgotten the fear mixed with disbelief of those moments. It was frightening. It was really unbelievable that this could happen. It didn't really sink in. It didn't really say it was impossible, it would not, you know. But you know, like everything else, when something comes up, you totally want to deny it, or you want to just say to yourself, can't be true. I couldn't believe it, you know. I said, just, he's just talking, you know, because we lived there for such a long time, you know, you could never expect that somebody just comes and tell you that you are going, you know. So I never thought this would happen. But my parents soon realized that this was all too real, as threats of rape, torture, and murder spread quickly through the Asian community, the great exodus began. People were told to get out and get out fast. 
They could take just two suitcases and 50 pounds cash. Amin told the soldiers that it was open season on Asians. No one was safe, as my parents soon found out. One Sunday in the evening, <clears throat> one of the Amin soldiers apparently came to the house up in a truck. Uh, he had a machine gun with him. He came into the house and of course he told everybody to come into the lounge. I was in my bedroom. Uh, my wife was there, my sister and my brother. And he pointed the gun at me here and my brother and he says, look, leave the women here and we want you to go to the police station which was at the bottom of the road to report and you were supposed to leave the women here. Now obviously we were frightened because the, the guy was drunk on something and his intentions were malicious. There was nothing we could do. Malicious intentions almost certainly meant rape. My mom and my aunt were so terrified they hid in a laundry room, ready to protect themselves with anything on hand. I was holding that eye and I said, if he comes in, if he does anything to her, I might put a hot iron on him, you know, and I was just standing with the eye with my mouth all open. We didn't want it to breathe even because I, we thought if we breathe, he might hear us, you know. In this climate of fear, my parents and thousands of others raced to beat the deadline. There were about 21 roadblocks. Every blocks we stopped, they were looking for people. I don't know if they were looking for me or they were looking for some other people, but every roadblock we stopped, the soldier would get in with the gun and tell us to open our luggage. Whatever he could do, he'd do. By the time we got to the airport, there wasn't very much left. In fact, for many, the last time they saw their luggage was at the check-in counter. The air hostess took us into the room and they stripped us to see what we are taking, you know? So everybody was stripped to check us how, what we are taking with us. We were supposed to take two suitcases, but on our flight, they always snatched one suitcase. So we were in England with just one suitcase. With much of the world still ignoring the expulsions, most of Uganda's Asians lost their homes, businesses, and property. My parents eventually settled in Canada, but part of who they are never left. Everything we owned was there. These were the possessions, the memories of the place. I could see when my father used to go to the mosque, where he used to sit. I could see when my mother is buried, when my brother is buried. You know. All those things he took away. And it was painful. Now, suddenly, I find myself staring at the family home, 35 years after my parents were forced to leave. This is where their hopes ended. I walk the halls my parents walked, the halls I might have learned to walk in if Idi Amin hadn't had that dream. That house was my house. We were seven brothers and um, five sisters. The seven houses were all built for my brothers, you know, and uh, it was nice. We had built it. Some of the happy you know memories are there some of the children were born there and uh, it is said sometimes i see picture what it has been what has been done to this property is shameful this uh house this belongs to my parents and they yeah they left in 1972. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take long for me to realize that the people that live here today have no idea about the history of this home, and they don't seem to care either. Without the Asians' expertise in business, the Ugandan economy suffered, even though Idi Amin had accused them of exploiting Uganda's resources. Asians have kept themselves apart as a closed community and have refused to integrate 
with Ugandan Africans. Their main interest has been to exploit the economy of Uganda Africans. They have been milking the economy of the country. I can see, you know, if had we done something to the Ugandans or if we were unfaithful or as he calls it, milking the cow. I mean, how could we be milking the cow when we had shoe factories, businesses there, plantations, housing estates, whatever we earned was being plowed back into the economy. It had taken my father so many years away, his lifetime to build businesses and to leave that and to be thrown out and to be abused, you know, is very difficult. My parents never came back and never will, but thousands of others did, hoping to find their beloved country as it once was. Idi Amin is long gone, but many other things have also changed. The returning Asians may have been able to reclaim their wealth, but for many, that success has been mixed with fear. The sins of Uganda's past have spilled into its future. in the post amin years has come a long way. The vicious dictatorships of the past are gone. There is democracy and a fragile recovery is underway. The government has made some smart decisions. In 1991, it started asking the Asians to come home offering those who were banished their property and businesses back. It has been a stunning reversal of policy and an admission of failure. So why did the new government change the rules? Simple, really, the economy. Uganda had suffered without the Asians and their smart and successful business know-how. If you want your economy to recover, you should remember that uh, there are people who run the economy of this country who will not allow them to come back and participate in the recovery of the economy. Then too, uh, I think President Museveni knew and still knows that these Asians were Ugandans. Most of them, the majority that were expert were Ugandans. Uh, these properties belonged to them. So he had to come and uh, give it to them. And of course, there must have been pressure from the international communities. Mohamed Huda was only five years old when his family was kicked out of Uganda. They lost everything, including their rose farm. When he returned, nothing was the same. Basically, this whole entire place was bush. The houses behind here were all dilapidated. The factories had goats inside, chickens, and you know, half the roofs were not existent and we basically had to go in and rebuild. And rebuild he did with great success. Mohammed is now a millionaire. While he's glad to be back, he's blunt about the mess the country was and is still in. Uganda lost everything. You know, the place was called the Pearl of Africa. It was absolutely fantastic. There were perfectly manicured lawns. The streets were fantastic. The country was beautiful. But at the end of the day, forget all the aesthetics. There was an immense brain drain here. The hospitals have gone to, you know, the dog, so to speak. The education system was bar none, and now it is basically non-existent. It is going to take probably two more generations just to rebuild the society here as a whole. Thousands of Asians, like Mohammed Huda, have returned to Uganda to reclaim property. Many have done well. 
But as I walk through downtown Kampala, I'm puzzled by the fact I rarely see any. There are virtually no Asians on the streets. When I get to the busy marketplace, I hear people jeering at me. Indians go home, they say. I was shocked. But perhaps I was being naive. After all, just a few months ago, black Ugandans began rioting. Breaking into Asian businesses and even beating some Asians to death. It was an ugly, racist reminder of a terrible past. I feel that tension in the streets, a clear resentment towards the Asians. And it's not uncommon. It was a few jobs, lacking of jobs, because of they, they were dismissed by the I army. Mean, I remember. But it was also good for Ugandans. And now, after the Indians went, they started coming in Kampa, and they started working as you see. And when they came back, you see, Ugandans, we are lacking jobs. They are consuming everything economical, so Ugandans are not doing anything. Each thing they are, they are saying that they are investors, they come as investors, it invest in a very local, local businesses, which we can do. So that's why I don't like them. Like my parents, Golzar and Amin Shivji had just married when they were kicked out of Uganda in that summer of 1972. Now they're back and running a very successful organic farm. But it hasn't been easy, and the constant reminders of the past have kept others from even trying. As far as the returnees go, uh, I, I don't think many have come back because some with uh, such good lives and such success stories in the West they have not come back. Some have not even come to visit. I think that for some it was such a bad, bad nightmare that they, they don't even want to come back and think about this country. And there are times Golzar's confidence is tested too. I asked her to come with me to the home she fled in 1972. She'd never been back. She was hesitant at first, but then she started reliving old memories. Her marriage, those few days in the house, and finally being forced out. As I was just coming up here, I did remember my wedding day, being welcomed here by my mother-in-law. Suddenly, the new owner turned up and was not happy. In fact, she was angry and wanted us off the premises right away. But I'm just saying the fact that we are the owners right now. We left. For Golzar, it was the second time she's been unwelcome inside these walls. It's moments like this, the fear of what was and what could be again, that makes it hard for Golzar and her husband to really consider this place home. It cannot be forgiven. As much as you try, it cannot be forgiven. All right. And number two, at, at, at the very back of your mind, when you read a lot of things in paper nowadays, you say, is, is it ever going to happen again or not? So will Uganda's Asian population have a future in this country? Will the two races ever be able to bury the past? The Asian community in Uganda lived an exclusive life where they had been given a rank in our society as second-rate citizens. Of course, the British were the first ones, then the Asians the second-rate citizens, and the blacks were the third-rate citizens. They underrated the Africans. The Africans worked, did the dirty work, you know, uh, when the Asians were here, working for the Asians. And uh, some of them who have come back, came back, I think, with the same mentality of thinking that probably uh, they are above the African, uh, they are still better business persons than uh, the Africans. But then they found, I think, the situation is a little bit different. 
and uh, so you, once in a while you these tensions are there in the businesses and uh, in the day-to-day -day life I would like to say here that the ghost of Idi Amin still hovers over this city and country even though he's long gone his son is very much here <laughs> Deban Amin is a former rebel leader. He's now a major player in Uganda's secret service, the organization his father used to maintain his reign of terror. Some here predict the son could even be the president himself one day. I've been trying to meet with him for days. Deban Amin is a big man, just like his father. Even looks a bit like him too. Finally, I was getting my chance. My parents are... Uh, they Asians. were they're Asians yeah. and they were in Uganda. Yeah. They were in Uganda. What they told me is that they were expelled from the country in 1972. He never expelled them. He gave them. He told them, "Listen, you people, we, this is Uganda. This is not Asian because Indians were running everything in the town. You can't find a black man in a in a shop. You just find a black man, a boy, doing dirty works, and the Indians were the owner of the country, which is wrong. Nobody can let anybody come and joke in his land. So the old man told these people, okay, you have a solution, or to, to go away, or to change your nationality. You see, this is the thing people don't understand. He never expe expelled them. He said, you change your nationality, you start your life also in the village, like everybody started. Then you come slowly, 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 and become a millionaire. After a life of growing up learning to hate Idi Amin, what happened in my time together with his son came as a surprise to me. Despite the overwhelming evidence, Deban Amin was still in a state of denial about his father's abhorrent policies. But let's not forget what Idi Amin's legacy really was. I think he was a most shameful spectacle on Uganda's situation will take many, many years to rebuild what she destroyed. That's the legacy, as far as I'm concerned, that uh, I think of the man. If you talk to uh, some others you may, who, for example, benefited from occupying these uh, Asian properties, then they say Amin was a wonderful person. Uh, Amin created an ethic that you don't need to work to get anything. And that is uh, the legacy which he left for some of them. Many Asians have returned hoping for a better life. But instead, there's a constant undercurrent of uncertainty, fed by feelings of resentment on the part of many black Ugandans. And it seems to linger everywhere. I often look at that old wedding picture of my parents. I stare at their smiling faces and try to imagine the plans they must have had in Kampala. It has been a difficult struggle. My entire life, I've witnessed the quiet, yet very evident bitterness they share about what they left behind. I would have loved to raise my family uh, in Uganda. I'm still sentimentally connected to Uganda. I would love to go to Uganda. I have friends in Uganda. But there are things that are stopping me to go there. I am looking for security. There has got to be transparency. There has got to be accountability. That is where I was born. And once you are in Uganda, that blood is in you. And it's very difficult to explain. Difficult to explain, perhaps, but not any longer for me. I've seen where the dream was lost. So many of the old divisions still remain. And that's sad. Uganda is a beautiful country, but it's still looking for its future.